I will turn it over to Shirley Sagawa, who will introduce today's topic for our webinar. Shirley. Hey, thanks, Naeem. I hope everyone can see my PowerPoint um, on your screen. Um, some of you will have, um, have uh, who participated in the, the conference in Washington last June, will, some of this will seem familiar. Um, but we wanted to share it with a wider audience and um, maybe give you a little bit of a refresher at a time when we think storytelling is, is extremely important. Um, we, we will also have a future webinar featuring Julie Dixon, who um, was a presenter at our workshop who uh, talked a lot about social media and photography, and I think that was a really terrific presentation, and so we'll be sharing that at a later date. Um, so, uh, oh gosh. Okay, why is my slides not moving? Sorry, we there we go. Um, you know, we 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 all ha those of you who have impact volunteering grants know that we we ask you to to include stories in your quarterly reports, and um, you know many of you are doing a terrific job with that. But uh, we do that for a couple reasons. One, we really need these stories so that we can be promoting cities of service broadly to others. Um, but we also think it's a great exercise for um, you know any anybody who's in the helping business, which we all are, to be able to tell certain stories. Um, and you know I always talk about the stories you need to be able to tell. One is the founding story, and that's probably a story you're going to tell about your mayor and how your mayor decided to become a city of service or or to develop a plan or what what the you know how certain things got into the plan. So ha telling that story of how you came came into um, being a, a, a C CSO or creating an impact volunteering initiative is is a, a great story that you'll use a lot. Um, another one is a lesson learned story. I think these stories always kind of show that you're you're smart, you're improving, you know, you're listening. It's just a, a great relationship kind of story to be able to tell. So you know, gosh, we were doing this, and then we um, discovered a better way, and and that's the. The, the lessons learned. But today we're going to focus on stories of impact, um, which we think are tremendously um, useful in a whole variety of settings, and we'll be talking about that later. So to kind of tee this up, we have a, a little skit um, which we're going to be sharing, and we uh, would like to, uh, I hope that um, Laurel is on the line. Laurel, are you there? Uh-oh. Maybe she muted herself. Well, Katie, Katie Leenberger, you're here, still here. Uh oh, am I talking to myself? I hear you, Shirley. Yeah, I hear you, Shirley. <laughs> okay, is Katie Leenberger there? Katie. That's weird. Okay, well, Deb, how about you and I do this? <laughs> hey. Do you want to play the funder or the CSO? Um, I'll play the funder. Okay. So we're going to walk through this little skit now just to give you, uh, you know, something that might actually happen. So um, we, we, you all, you'll be able to follow along on the screen. Shirley, hi. Hi, it's great to see you. How are things going at uh, the Community Foundation? Oh, oh you're, you're the funder. You, oh, okay. me, sorry. I'm the funder. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's great to see you. How are things at the Community Foundation? Oh, they're great, great, great. What's new with you at the mayor's office? Have I told you about the Mayor's Community Gardening Initiative? I think you did mention it right before you launched last year. Hey, how's that going? Excellent. Our pilot intervention to address the city's food deserts through raised bed community gardens and positively impact the nutritional impact of disadvantaged youth through skills building training presented by expert volunteers yielded an average of 10 pounds of produce per family throughout the third quarter of last year and significantly impacted consumption of nutritionally superior meals as indicated by self-reports. We are initiating a second year with a 10% expansion and hope to grow further next year, perhaps with your support. Um, uh, yeah, great, yeah, whatever, I gotta go, bye. <laughs> okay, let's try that again. It's great to see you. How are things at the Community Foundation? Oh, they're great, thanks. What's new with you at the mayor's office? Have I told you about the Mayor's Community Gardening Initiative? Uh, I think you mentioned it right before you launched last year. How's it going? 
Excellent. Let me tell you a fun story. So last year, the mayor and I stopped by the day of the zucchini harvest at the community garden on the north end. You know, this neighborhood does not have a single grocery store, even though it has a liquor and cigarette shop on every corner. At the harvest day, the chef of the mayor's favorite restaurants there showing the moms how to do something with zucchini. She's putting it in spaghetti sauce, making zucchini bread, slicing them long and thin like fries. You get the idea. And there's this boy, maybe eight, and he's looking over at his mom by the chef, and he has this awful look on his face. The mayor says to him, what's wrong? And he says, we don't eat green things in my house. And I'm thinking, everyone here is taking home 10 pounds of zucchini this week. Good luck. Now, fast forward to this spring, and I go back to the neighborhood where they are replanting the garden for this year. And the kid is there with a shovel in his hand, and he's furiously digging away. So I go up to him, and I ask him what he's planting. And he puts on this big grin, and he tells me, zucchini, zucchini flies are my favorite food. How cool is that? Maybe you'd like to join me for the harvest this year. Oh, my gosh. That is amazing. I'd love to do that. I'd, I'd love to learn something new to do with the mountains of zucchini. My mom gets this in her garden. Perfect. I'll send you the date in our fact sheet. I left out the best part about how 85% of the families in the garden project say they're now eating vegetables with most meals. We're planning to add five gardens next year. Maybe you could think about sponsoring the expansion. Let's definitely keep talking. And please send me that fact sheet. Bravo, Deb. Thank you. <laughs> So um, here I wanted to pause and you know give, give you the chance to go off mute, uh, anybody who's out there, and, and just say, how are those two stories different? Hi, this is Marcia. They were majorly different, Shirley and Deb. The first one was a lot of facts that were sort of random and could be considered as abstract, and the second one was a human story that you tuned into and wanted to hear. Thanks, Marcia. I mean, uh, they both had um, they both had some data in them, but you know, one of them I think was a lot easier to. I'll tell you, when I was reading it, it was a lot easier to read the second one because it was kind of more like how people actually talk. Exactly. <laughs> it's probably easier to listen to too. Mhm. I think the challenge. Yeah, Deb, this is Deb again. I think the challenge, Shirley, is actually a lot of people in our world talk like the first person. They I mean, certainly I hate write that way. <laughs> yeah, I certainly write that way. But I've also, you know, I, I think a lot, of the, a lot of the writing and the conversation could, is that way. Can you guys hear me? This is Katie. Yeah. Hey, Katie. Oh, hey. Magic. Um <laughs> So what I found interesting about the first story, that the reason I had trouble understanding it was because there were a lot of big words and I would argue probably jargon in there that I had to think through what it meant as you were talking so it was hard to follow. No, that's right. So the second one, we tried to make jargon-free. Great. And, you know, one other point that, that, that is that the, you could see, you could kind of picture some of the... The second one, you could at least have a little bit of a vision of what that neighborhood looks like. So in the first one, where you're, you know, even though it had some of the same information, you just didn't get any picture in your head. So those are some of the things that I thought about. Um, and kind of just moving us along, um, you know, that experience, you know, that's a story probably you could actually go and retell, um, whereas the first one probably you can't even remember what, what was said. Um, and what's great about stories is that they're they're both um you know you can remember them you can repeat them um we are we are naturally programmed to you know hear stories process them and share them that's something that's been part of you know human culture since the beginning of time right um and and there's also been a ton of research about storytelling which is partly why it's sort of you're probably hearing a lot about storytelling these days um and and you know, even scientific research going on in universities. There's, there's, you know, one one great study that kind of showed that um, if a person is in, in a person is going to be much more inclined to make uh, a charitable contribution to an to a uh, to a a cause that is, you know, about a single person as opposed to something that's more abstract. So at Carnegie Mellon, they um, they essentially had two different versions of a pitch about uh, Save the Children. One was sort of a you know, high-level discussing 
food shortages in Malawi, 3 million children, you know, they large cohorts of people in Africa falling, you know, are hungry. And then the other version kind of talked about a starving 7-year-old girl. And what happened, um, you know, they, then they tested to see uh, which which version elicited more more money? And the one that was about the girl as a, got two times more money than the one that was about the suffering of millions, and 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 that's kind of an interesting um, experiment. And lots of there's lots of versions of this experiment that have validated this premise that it, it it's it's ha- having that single you know story and and focusing on a person is going to be so much more persuasive than if you kind of give this you know, the 3 million people, or, or even probably, you know, take it down to the size of some of your cities. Maybe talking about a, a whole community is not going to be as persuasive as if you can talk about, you know, one of the people who's going to be helped. So, um, you know, that's one one uh, thing to think about. Um, and another thing is this, because stories are so much more memorable and because they interact with our brains on an emotional level, when we're um, – we, when, we, when we hear a story or see a video – um, we remember that and think it's more persuasive, even when we're told contradictory information. So there was there were some studies at the University of Michigan, where um, the study participants were essentially given you know a hugely stereotypical story about you know what used to be called the welfare queen, um, about a you know somebody who had had uh, was just collecting money from the government and had all these kids born every you know 18 months and you know was taking buying high priced cuts of meat with their food stamps and playing the numbers and and you know just long long term on welfare so they they told this terribly stereotypical you know negative story in in um I think it was a video and then they they took the participants into another room and they gave them all kinds of facts that explained that people. Most people on public assistance are responsible people, and you know that this this welfare queen profile was not a typical case. And you know, none, then they gave them a questionnaire, and overwhelmingly, people believed the video story about the welfare queen, and they didn't believe the the, the actual facts that they were given about the people on public assistance. And then they repeated this with a different um, sto- set of stories about prison guards, where they had a video of a, an abusive guard, and then you know presented facts that showed that most guards are professional and decent and humane, but people still believed the negative. So you know, there, there's just a lot of reasons why we're sort of, we are hardwired to kind of not only um, believe stories, but to remember them and repeat them. And that's why they can be so much more um, effective when we're trying to sell our, our pr- projects. Um, but we, we, we at Cities of Service care a lot about data and there's good reasons for that as well. Um, you know, one reason um, is it just helps you do better. Uh, there's, a, there's a movie, Moneyball, which I'm sure many of you have seen, um, about baseball and data. Um, the uh, Oakland A's um, some years ago had a, a, a manager named Billy Bean who decided to kind of use, use real statistics um, to kind of, you know, essentially find players he could afford with his low budget and um, make choices not based on the the stereotypical views that that the scouts had about who would make a good baseball player, but in fact, you know, really drilling down on the right numbers to figure out, you know, who should they try to get onto the team, and and they, you know, went on this amazing winning streak, and you probably all seen the movie, which features Brad Pitt, and it's actually pretty good. Um, but you know, there's, that's now in Washington. Everybody's talking about you know Moneyball for government because there is really a a desire to improve um, you know d- decisions and programs to have the highest impact. Uh, and you know, of course, when you're going to institutional funders, and of course, when you're going to um, city service as well, uh, you know they. They will want to know the data. You can't get by with some good anecdotes. They're, you know, they're, we're, we're going to want to know how how did it really go. You know, and you're going to learn from collecting data. I've heard from from many of the the CSOs that I work with about, um, you know, ha- having deciding to make programmatic changes based on, you know, well this worked out better than that as we're collecting information. So um, they really work well together. You need both. So we don't want you to kind of walk away from this webinar thinking, oh, well, we we don't need the data anymore. They're all about stories. But you need them both. So how do you write a good story? Um, the good news is you already know how. You, you've, you've known this since you were very young. You when you were told stories. Um, this is a there's a little game we can't play it here because we're we're all in different places. But uh, we played it at the session in um, Washington, and and I've played it with lots of different groups. 
and it's basically you take a you take a piece of paper, and at the top everybody gets a piece of paper, and at the top they answer they write once upon a time, and then you write you know their lived uh, whatever, and then you fold down what you wrote and pass it to the next person who can't see what you said, and they write and every day, and then you add to the story. So it's a little bit of a blind story that's being built by being handed around a table, and at the end people can open up their um, papers and and read it out loud and and it's amazing that even even like in the silliest situations you you end up with stories that actually seem a little bit coherent. I, I'll give you an example of one we did the other day with some kids. Um, once upon a time there was a prince and every day he went to the boardwalk with his friends until one day the giant under the bridge attacked him with many soldiers from Utah and because of this the world fell into terror and was full of teenage girl drama until finally the air conditioning broke making it too hot to survive and ever since that day the world is still in peril so it's very silly some teenagers wrote this but you can see how the structure kind of makes it feel like a story and so you know as you think about your stories um you know, trying to have that kind of a, you know, set up, you know, action, climax, resolution will, will make the story, you know, be more memorable. Um, you all know the Cinderella story. This is um, uh, another consultant who kind of mapped it on that same story arc. Um, and, you know, it, it, it really, you know, you, you'll now think about this every time you hear a story on the news even. So, you know, just to kind of go through what are the elements of the story that you really need, um, you know, there's got to be a point. So uh, if you're going to tell a story, have a reason for telling it um, and, and um, make sure that the story actually makes the point that you're trying to make. Um, you need to have enough background information to, to put context around the, the action that you're going to tell. So, you know, give, give enough background, you know, what, what happened, what was the norm, you know, is this a, a community where, um, you know, people were not, uh, were there, there were food deserts. Well, maybe you need to help people visualize a food desert because that's a piece of jargon. We'll talk about that later, that maybe not everyone knows what it means. And you need characters. So um, who are you talking about? And that's that's really important given what we were talking about earlier, how you need the one, you need a, a person to, to kind of evoke that sort of response. And then you want to have it follow that story arc where you you set up a problem, something happens, and the problem is resolved. So you have some kind of a, um, uh, you know, action and, and resolution. And if you tried to if you could go back to my little story game template back here, you know, you could tr you could actually go ahead and use that as your frame and, you know, you don't have to use the kind of silly once upon a time language, but it really is the same format as you would want to have. And you can like if you want to map this zucchini story onto this, um, you know, yes, there is a purpose. The purpose of this story is what? It's to, you know, communicate that this initiative is working and making a difference in people's lives. Um, you know, that we I think there's some pretty good back, background information in the story. So we kind of know this is a new initiative. It's the mayor's initiative. That there's, it's it's um, you know, it, it is designed to, uh, you know, we know what the activities are. Um, we know the setting. We can picture the the liquor store and cigarette shop on every corner. We we see that there's a harvest festival going on. There's a chef chopping things. So you can kind of see that action. And then we've got characters. We've got this little boy who doesn't like vegetables. And then we, you know, we see that, you know, through his experience of being able to take home the zucchini and his mom learning how to cook it, he actually learns to eat green vegetables. So um, that's kind of how that would work. So I would probably give this based on those. I would check all the boxes for this story. Um, another thing to think about in storytelling is detail. So, you know, again, the, the, the little boy and the wrinkly nose and the zucchini fries being chopped long, and those are examples of details. Um, and, and what research tells us is that details actually help make your story more memorable, because probably because they help you paint a picture in your head. And in fact, they help you persuade um, uh, people. So this, the, you're probably wondering why there's a picture of a toothbrush. It's a Darth Vader toothbrush, if you look carefully. And there was a, 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 um, a study that kind of tested, again, this is also at University of Michigan, testing um, uh, how, how, how the use of details in a, in a legal argument um, would influence um, judges and jurors. So they simulated a trial to judge the fitness of a mom of a seven-year-old, and there's two versions of the trial trans, of the transcript. So in one, and, and in both, the arguments kind of cut both ways. So there'd be eight arguments in favor of the mom, eight arguments against the mom having custody. But in one version of the transcript, they 
made the they used the arguments in favor of the mom had all the detail in them and the others didn't and then they reversed it so an example of the detail in favor of the mom would be she made sure the child brushed his teeth using a star wars toothbrush that looks like darth vader now you know anybody with kids knows that's really probably not you shouldn't be determining fitness based on what the toothbrush actually looked like but because the details, whichever way the details were assigned, so if the details were assigned to the case favoring the mom, then people voted, the mock jurors voted to let the, the mom keep the child. And when the details favored taking the child away, that's how they voted. So it's pretty amazing how those details can convince you to um, you know, go the other way. Um, it's also kind of important to show and not tell. So when you're thinking about um, you know, trying to explain um, you know, something, you, you want to be able to give an example, paint a picture as opposed to saying something. So you can say somebody, you know, this person was terribly underweight, but it would be better to be able to say you know, uh, it was something that kind of spoke to uh, you know, how, how they were so slender that it was, you know, hard to see them past the tree. You know, come up with some details that show, but don't don't just kind of hit you over the head with the this, this specific well conclusion. And you want to be concise, and you want to make every word count, and you want to be speaking in the language that your audience speaks. So um, that's really important, and I think that is why some of our stories fall flat. Is you know, we might be talking, we all talking about food deserts all the time, and 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 it may not be that everybody knows what food deserts are. <laughs> Uh, next couple slides, I think I'm going to skip through. Um, these are a couple other stories that actually I'll, I'll do this quickly. You can, I'm not going to read them to you. You can just take a quick look at this one. You know, this this is uh, one version of a story. It's very factual. Um, it's uh, about a person, so it fits that. It's about a person, but there's just nothing in here that gives you a picture of of this person. You don't know anything about her other than that she was old, older and living on a fixed income and couldn't afford the help. In the story, we know what she gets, and you know we feel pretty good. This is great, but it's not—it's not, it's not emotional. Like it's not telling. So there's no details. Um, it's in—it's got a little bit of a jargony language in it as we're talking about retrofits, and 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 it, it just doesn't really speak to me. So here's an actual story that was submitted by I think Nashville um, uh, in a past year that I just thought was, you know, such a charming story that I really remembered it. Um, and I'm not going to read it to you. You can read it on the screen if you are using the screen. But it, it, it speaks about, you know, it, it's it's the, from the perspective of one of the project managers and her experience um, interacting with a homeowner. And uh, and you know, there's there's things, there's ways this could be improved. But I think it's a, a tremendously evocative story. And yes, it has data in it at the end. But it really does give you a, a sense of, you know. The person who's being helped is a, you know, is a, a tremendously caring person who who is greatly appreciative of the work that's being done, and that yes, she's poor and couldn't afford it, but, you know, is a is a um, a person who we can you know respond to. So, um, and in fact, the next slide I just kind of bolded all the details. So, you know, we've got paint-covered work boots, and we've got you know, words in quotes, the conversation, my, your feet must ache being in those all day. And we have her sitting at the kitchen table feverishly knitting. And, um, you know, it's so so having those kinds of details, it really, it's a story that it's much easier to remember than the one about, you know, the low-income senior citizen getting retrofits. Um, I am a total jargon nut. Um, when we first were working um I'm a lawyer by training, and when we were writing AmeriCorps regulations back in about 10 jobs ago, um, we actually took our regulations and we gave them to a journalist and said, read these and kind of, you know, let's put them in English. Um, so, you know, it's really important to be able to communicate with an audience, and if you're speaking one language and they're speaking something else, you're not going to communicate clearly. So I threw up on this, this slide just to set some, some actual language from a variety of sources that um, perhaps some of you are familiar with these languages, but I'm not. Um, you know, I have no idea what a software-defined network is. Um, this, you know, Eternity, an Intel capital portfolio company, redefines end-user experience management by providing the industry's first patented frontline performance intelligence platform. have no idea what that is. At E3 this week, 2K Games revealed an announced trailer of sorts. What is E3? <laughs> you know, somebody knows that. So if you're speaking to an audience that's really 
you know, speaks this language, it probably works. But one of at least one of these was sent to me in an email um, promoting their product, and they clearly missed the mark because um, no idea what they're talking about. But you know, when I think, do we actually have jargon in our our field? And we actually do. Um, and so we have to think really hard as we're talking to people outside the service world. They might not actually know. Um, what we mean by some of these terms. Leveraged volunteers is a very common one in the national service space. What are leveraged volunteers? Put yourself, you know, ask your um, ask your grandma or your husband or your neighbor, and they won't know what a leveraged volunteer it was. Um, you know, so many of these things we, um, and maybe some of you don't even use this jargon, so um, this is jargon that I hear a lot when I interact with people in the world, um, in the service world. Um, if you really want to make your story sing, you know, having some um, extra uh, credit here, um, having a, a hook. So when a journalist writes a story, having that, um, having that lead they call it that really draws you into the piece is is important. So you know, can you think of how do you start your story so people are immediately drawn in? Um, you know, how interesting is it? Uh, is there a twist? So, you know, stories that have a twist are particularly memorable. And, you know, what's the emotional power? Uh, and the more you can kind of incorporate those in, um, the more effective your storytelling will be. So here's, I made this little checklist, and we, we can share this with you. Um, so when you write your story, you know, go through and see if it does all these things. And see if you can do better. And have somebody else read it. You know, have somebody who is not, you know, your colleague at the next desk, read the story and see if, if they can respond to it. And have them circle any words they don't understand or questions that come to mind as they're reading it that they wish they knew, like, gosh, where, you know, what does this neighborhood look like? Are there any trees? You know, they may want to know things like that. So, um, you know, we, we, we urge you to kind of go through that checklist um, as you're putting things together. So as, as we um, uh, move out of the, the actual how do you write a story? I just want to pause and see if people have any comments or questions, and then we'll spend a few minutes talking about how we use stories. And feel free if you want to just throw anything into that chat box. But since we're just first learning how to use the WebEx, uh, I think we're probably not all using all of its many amazing functions. But um, you could also, if you don't want to jump in, go ahead and type something in. Any, any questions or comments? Hey, Shirley, this is Naeem. Hey, Naeem. Can you hear me? Hey, I, I had a question. <laughs> Great, we got that solved. Uh, I had a question around jargon. Certain terms, I would imagine, it's very difficult to replace. So I think I saw on the list, like, chief service officer, CSO. A lot of folks may not know what that is, but it's very difficult to come up with a new term to replace that because it seems like you'd just be recreating the problem of jargon. So would you recommend for folks to take time as part of their story to explain those terms or just do away with them, and maybe you lose a bit of understanding and knowing what those positions are, but you make it up, uh, make up for it elsewhere. Like, how should folks handle that? I think that's a great question, Aim, and I, I, I think that you know, depending on who the audience is, um, you certainly want to take the time to explain what a chief service officer is. Um, so, if they are talking to perhaps another funder. Um, it's going to be important that you define chief service officer. And I will say, I think the plain language chief service officer, sometimes people probably think that means the person in charge of city services, you know, like the waste management or um, <laughs> those kinds of things. Um, I've certainly seen that confusion in the past. But if you're talking to, you know, you're talking to a mom in the neighborhood, I think it's it's fine to say, you know, you know, my job is I'm, I'm the lead person in the mayor's office to help the mayor think about how volunteers can help solve important city problems. And maybe that's a few extra words, but um, by shortcutting and using the term chief service officer, we're not communicating as effectively as if we take the extra time to kind of you know, lay it out. And, and maybe, I don't know if anybody on the call has had uh, an effective way to explain chief service officer to kind of lay people who have never heard the term. Uh, we just call it the director of volunteer services or like office of volunteer resources director. And then people know what that is because it's volunteers is a more common term. Correct. Great. Great, thanks. Terrific. So I'm gonna I'm just gonna move us along um, to talk about uh, story banking, um, and this is my last slide. 
Uh, but I, I thought it would be great if, if people would be willing to jump in and talk about how they use stories and how they collect them. So what I mean by story banking, and that's a jargon term too, I totally realize that, <laughs> um, is collecting stories and, and um, hanging on to them so that you can use them when you need them, something as simple as that. Like how do I find out what's going on as a result of my initiatives um, Find it, you know, get enough detail and interesting information that I can actually, you know, write a story, and then and store it in a way that the next time I need it for the mayor to give a speech, for example, I actually have it handy. And and this is, I mean, it, it's funny, but I think that this is actually one of the hardest things for a lot of people in in a whole variety of of fields, where if you're not the one out on the ground interacting on a day to day with the clients, um, you 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 know you're not getting those stories you know you're, you're maybe you're getting the reports with the numbers maybe you're getting um you know you're getting a high level information but you're not necessarily getting good stories you can use so you actually have to kind of go out and, and ask for them and, and work for them um you know some organizations figure out a way to like reward stories that are submitted or incentivize submitting stories so another one organization that Deb and I have done some work with was just very clever about um, you know having a phone line that people could call in and leave a recorded story because sometimes it's easier to tell a story than to write a story. Um, so they we're finding they weren't going to necessarily get what they wanted by um, you know asking for th stories to be written down and emailed in, but when they made it a, a, an easy call in that anybody could call and say guess guess what happened today, they started getting a lot more stories that they could then follow up on. Maybe the person didn't tell the story in the most you know compelling way, but a, a follow up call could elicit a lot of additional details and enable somebody to kind of write it up. And often a press office or, um, you know, somebody who's affiliated with the city can help kind of construct the stories in a really interesting way or even help follow. That could be a volunteer role to actually follow up with, um, you know, finding those stories. So I'd love to ask some of the CSOs on the call, how, you know, how if you've had any luck collecting stories and if you've collected good ones, how are you using them to advance your cause? Hey, Shirley, it's Michael Drake in Little Rock. Hey, Michael. How are you? Good. Good to talk to you. Um, so what we've been doing since we launched um, our Love Your School initiative with our uh, VISTA team is every afternoon when um, school ends, all of our members meet at uh, uh, a location in, at a – uh, Midtown Community Center, where we kind of kind of vista ground zero, and mm -hmm. my assistant conducts um, a little meeting in which she sits in the center of the room, and the vista sit in a circle around her at their desks, and they talk about one experience they had that day that brought a smile to their face or helped them understand that they're making a difference in the lives of the kids, or the staff, or the parents they're serving, and those end up on our. Um, I love your school website as service clips. Mm, fantastic. Yeah, so, uh, so we're using you your ideas videos. from actually we I took all the stuff that you gave us uh when we had the uh the first seminar on service uh, on storytelling. I think that was in Chicago. Uh-huh. And uh we've used that um to kind of mold uh their thinking around um how they're making a difference, how they're moving the needle in an incremental way. And I, I'll tell you, it has, a, it has a tremendous psychological uh, impact on those who've had a terribly difficult day and they don't see anything going on at their school because they're able to buy in and share in a laugh or an emotional moment. Uh, just want to share one, if I could. Oh, please, that'd be great. This is from a young woman whose name is LaShawn Burton. Uh, she said, as I, I'm reading it from the website, as I was working in my office at Geyer Springs Elementary School today, I couldn't help but overhear a conversation between a parent and a staff member in which the parent announced that she was so looking forward to the Cooking Matters program starting up again at Geyer Springs. She began right. telling the staff member that she and her three children, all students at Geyer Springs Elementary School, participated in the Love Your School program last year, Cooking Matters class, and loved every moment of it. She went on to say that since the program was introduced, she had been so dedicated to the knowledge she obtained 
with nutrition and how to purchase groceries that she has lost an estimated 57 pounds, oh my. staying committed to a healthy lifestyle, and preparing the recipes at home found in the book that she received. Although I was not in her presence, I could hear the excitement and sense of fulfillment in her voice as she told her story. Just simply overhearing her conversation provided me with an affirmation that the work of the Love Your School initiative is a vital part of community health behavior change. Oh, you know, that gives me chills when I hear that. Oh, that's that's why we're so doing much. this. And that that's, an, I think, a real effective way um, of communicating a moment in a story that not only sells the program, but helped everyone in that room understand that they're making a difference. That is a great story, and I think it's brilliant to be videotaping them and using them this way. It's fantastic. So glad to hear it. So thank you for um, what you did for us in Chicago and what you're continuing to do with these uh, this guidance. It, the mayor uses these stories all the time. Um, we have the video of our of our launch on our website um, in August, and he tells a couple of stories that were conveyed to him by our, our members. And so it's, it's helping him. It helps the city board. Uh, it helps uh, the community, all our volunteer organizations. And we've asked them to start giving us stories that we're starting to post on our oh, website. So it's, it's, it's like mining gold to us. That is so great. And I know, you know, for political officials, like to have some stories to tell, they're always having to give speeches. And it's so much easier to make a speech if you have some stories. And I, when I used to work for Senator Kennedy, I knew if I wanted him to talk about my, my, my projects as opposed to everybody else's, I had to feed stories in. And, um, you know, we, when, back when he was championing service learning, you know, we, we made sure he did site visits so that he could go back and talk about it to other senators because you have to have something to say. and cite, They won't remember any numbers from studies. So that's fantastic, Michael. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. Anybody else? This is Laurel from Nashville. Sorry that oh. I was MIA. I, I no was on the other conference line um, oh, diligently. Oh, sorry. No, it's okay. It's my fault. I RSVP to Naeem directly, so sorry about that. Um, no, I was just saying what we do is we interview our volunteers post-service um, and get their stories and what they've experienced and what impact and value that they took away from the experience and any stories that they um, had seen or uh, was a part of that we could record and have on hand. Um, we either have them write it or they tell it to us over the phone if they prefer whatever works best. And um, from my work in years in radio, a lot of times theater of the mind is something that always comes comes to my thought process when I'm sharing stories. It's like you want to create that theater of exactly what happened and that experience like you just mm -hmm. did earlier in the call. Um, and when you can have that idea of theater in the mind um, for, for your storytelling, it seems to be uh, much more helpful to, to come up with the, the wording around it and the coloring around it and the emotions around it. So I just wanted to share that. Thanks. Has your mayor used any of your stories? How, have you been able to get them into the press? Like how, how is, I know you've got some great ones. Um, yes, we have. Um, he tends to focus on one or two of them. One, there's one for education. There's one for environment. And for the environment one, he talks about um, going to a tree planting event, and there are 20 people in one shovel, and how it just wasn't very impactful, and people didn't even know why we were planting a tree there. And so, um, the value of cities of service and how um, what we're doing is is more impactful and meaningful than that kind of experience. So. Mm. He he does. He tends to um, stay on target with one or two stories that he can relate to and um, keep telling those over, and it's, it's still as impactful as it was the first time he told it. That's so great. 